Tonight we begin in Ephesians chapter 2, and it's our intention to cover the whole chapter this evening. And I know that it's a big uh, section of scripture to take in one evening, because it's very easily the kind of passage that is so filled with uh, truth and so filled with spiritual insight that you could spend several weeks, several months going through a careful examination verse by verse through Ephesians chapter 2. Yet we're making our way through the book of Ephesians at a little bit faster speed. Last week, we dared to take the whole uh, first chapter in one week, but we're doing this deliberately because we believe that there's a value in taking an overview of the book as well as taking a very short view of each particular phrase and each particular verse. But as we begin with chapter two this evening, I think the most important thing for us to consider is a statement that Paul made back in chapter 1, verse 10. Let's take a look at that together. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10, where he says, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. In this, Paul is pointing towards God's ultimate plan for creation, his ultimate plan for this created order, and that is to demonstrate the glory and the wisdom of God by summing up or reconciling all things into Jesus Christ at the end of the age. Last week, we sort of painted the picture that the idea that Paul has in using this terminology, it's as if God is writing out a huge mathematical problem upon the chalkboard of the universe, if you will. And as he's beginning to write it out, beginning at Genesis 1-1, at the creation of the universe, and he writes and writes and writes on the chalkboard, and then at some time uh, before the chalkboard is filled with this heavenly equation, he stops, he goes down to the bottom right-hand corner, And he writes the solution to the problem, the solution to this great problem of the universe on this great celestial chalkboard is Jesus Christ. And then having told us that at the end, all things will add up into or sum up into or be reconciled into Jesus Christ, then he continues writing out this great equation of the universe, if you will. Well, this is God's great plan in this age. That is to demonstrate his glory, his wisdom, his surpassing love, and all these amazing attributes of his character by his work in this universe and summing it all up in Jesus Christ. Now, what God is very concerned to do for us is to give us a preview of that work. I mean, if he's going to reconcile all things in Jesus Christ, ultimately at the end, isn't it good for us to see God's ability to reconcile some things in him right here and right now? And that's what we're going to see in Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to see the reconciling work of God happen in this passage. So let's take a look here, starting Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. He says, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Now we have to stop here immediately at verse 1 and take a look at this idea that those words, he made alive in most English versions, are in italics. That means that they were added by the translator. They're implied by the text, but they're added by the translator because it's appropriate according to the context. Paul is writing to believers who were made alive by God's work, but he's calling to their attention the fact that previously they were dead in trespasses and sins. Now, though Christians are now alive, They must never forget where they came from. You were dead in trespasses and sins, but now God has made you alive. But I want you to think very carefully about that statement that you were dead in trespasses and sins. You know, one of the most tragic situations there can be for a family or for a person to go through is the uh, tragedy of what we call of when a woman gives a stillbirth, when a a baby is born but the baby that is delivered is, is dead while it is born. And that's, that's just a horrible situation. It's a heart-rending situation. But I want you to know that spiritually speaking, every person who is born in this world is born as a stillbirth. We are born spiritually dead. We come into this world spiritually dead because we are descendants of Adam and Eve. 
as sons of Adam and daughters of Eve, were born into this world spiritually dead. And I know what you do. You, you look at that little baby and say, it seems plenty alive to me. Well, understand what we mean by this. There are many different kinds of life. There's vegetable life. There's animal life. There's mental life. There's moral life. And there is spiritual life. A being might be alive in one sense, but dead in another sense. Have you ever heard the medical diagnosis? And I'm not a doctor, so please don't, don't quiz me on the accuracy. But it's a common way of speaking, that we speak of somebody perhaps who's had a tragic accident of being brain dead. Their body is alive. They're there on the bed. You see them. There's color in their face. Their heart is beating. Uh, from some sense, biologically, things seem to be apparently normal. Yet at the same time, it's clear there's something wrong in their mind, in their brain. They are what we would call brain dead. Well, are they dead or alive? Well, in one sense, they're alive. But in another sense, very clearly, they are dead. To be spiritually dead does not mean that we're physically dead. It doesn't mean that we're socially dead. It doesn't mean that we're psychologically dead. Yet, nevertheless, it is a real death. It's a dead death nonetheless. You could say that the most vital part of man's personality, the spirit, is dead to the most important factor in life, and that is God. So, as Charles Spurgeon said, they're dead, not in a moral sense, not in a mental sense, but in a spiritual sense. Poor humanity is dead. And so the word of God again and again most positively describes it. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. Now, this touches on one of the most controversial areas in theology. And that is this. In what manner and to what extent is a person dead before conversion? And this is where it breaks down theologically. You have some Christians who believe that the order of salvation goes somewhat like this. And again, I'm speaking in shorthand, so I can imagine a theologian listening to me somewhere and just wincing as I say these words. But please understand, I'm speaking in theological shorthand just for the sake of time here this evening. There are some who believe that the order of salvation is this. First you believe, then you are born again or regenerated. Other people believe, no, you must first be born again then you can believe. And this is a great division in the Christian world theologically. And it's simply this. Must a person be converted before they can believe? Or is there a prior work of God to instill faith in that person, a work of God that is short of conversion or being born again, but nevertheless is necessary so that the person can believe? You see, those people who argue that a man must be regenerated or born again before he can believe, like to point to this passage. And they like to say, a dead man can't believe. If you're dead in trespasses and sins, how can anybody call you to believe? You're dead, you're dead. But I have to say, I believe that this takes this particular description further than intended. To say that an unredeemed man is exactly like a dead body in every way, it is going too far. It's taking a picture, a valid picture, but it's taking it too far. Can I explain to you one way? Yes, a dead man cannot have faith, but neither can a dead man sin. Dead people don't sin anymore. And yet, spiritually dead, I still sin. I believe that we err if we think that to say dead in trespasses and sins says everything about a man's lost condition. We err because the Bible uses many different pictures to describe the state of unsaved man. The Bible says that an unsaved man is blind. The Bible says that an unsaved man is a slave to sin. The Bible says that an unsaved man is a lover of darkness, that he is sick, that he is lost, that he's an alien, a stranger, a foreigner, that he's a child of wrath, and that he's under the power of darkness. All of these are New Testament ideas or phrases associated with the unregenerate man. You see, just, just to say that dead in trespasses and sins says everything there is to say about unregenerate man, I think is taking one picture and extending it too far. Therefore, we would say that in some ways, the unregenerate man is dead. In other ways, he is not. Therefore, 
it is valid to appeal to all men to believe. You don't have to look for evidence of regeneration before you tell men to believe and to be saved. I I like what the Puritan writer John Trapp said about this. He said, however, the natural man, though he is theologically dead, is ethically alive. And he's to be worked upon by arguments. As it says in Hosea 1.14, I drew them by the cords of a man. That is, by the reasons and motives of love appropriate to the nature of a man. So the Spirit and the Word work upon us still as men by rational motives setting before us life and good, death and evil. Yes, it is true. We are dead dead in trespasses and sins. As far as our life to God is concerned spiritually, man is dead, dead, dead. And unless God does some prior work in that person, they can never come to faith. But I don't believe that it's accurate to say that that prior work must be making that person born again before they can believe. Instead, what does it say there in verse one? They're dead in trespasses and sins. Did you know there's a difference between trespasses and sins? The idea between trespasses is that we've crossed a line. You've ever seen the sign? No trespassing. Don't go past this line. Well, we've done that, haven't we? God's drawn a line for us. God has said, this is my holy standard, and we've gone beyond it. But then the idea behind the word sins is to miss a mark. Think of a target, right? A a bullseye. And there's an archer shooting arrows at a target. If you miss the target, you have sinned. So we've both crossed God's boundary and we have missed his mark. Trespasses speaks of man as a rebel. Sin speaks of man as a failure. We've done both. And so we've been made alive. We were dead in trespasses and sins. Now on to verses two and three, in which you once walked according to the course of this world. According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Well, if verse 1 states for us the fact of our prior spiritual death, then verses 2 and 3 describe for us the life of this death because there was a certain life that went along with the status of spiritual death. There's a walk. Have you ever seen walking dead men? And I'm not just talking about in a zombie movie or something like that. I'm talking about men who were spiritually dead, yet they still walked in a particular way. Well, that's what Paul's talking about here. You were spiritually dead, yet that's verse two, in which you once walked according to the course of the world. You see, at one time we lived in trespasses and sins according to the course of this world, and it's all orchestrated by Satan. Satan, who's described here in this passage as the prince of the power of the air, is still very much active among those who are in rebellion against God, against those who our text calls the sons of disobedience. And that's the environment in which we once walked. The self that once walked in this is the old man. Now he's crucified with Jesus at the time of conversion, but the sin nature inherited from Adam, it still influences the old man. But the world system and Satan also influenced the old man. Now, it says here, once walked. Did you notice that phrasing there in verse 2? Do you know what that implies for us? It implies that you don't walk that way any longer. You notice the contrast there? No longer is the believer to walk according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. That's not to be our walk anymore. The walk of the believer is to be different. Now, think of this analogy of the dead man again. Think of a dead body in a coffin, right? There it lays. Dead body in a coffin. Now I ask you, is the dead body comfortable in the coffin? I think so, right? It seems to sleep very much at ease there. The dead body just lays there in the coffin and it's all pillowed around them and very quiet and very dark. And the dead body is just fine there. But wait a minute, what if it were to happen that that body were to come alive again? Would it be comfortable in that coffin? No, it would instantly feel claustrophobic. It would instantly say, I can't live in this place any longer. I am now alive. I'm no longer dead. I must get out of this coffin and leave it behind. Isn't it strange? It's very strange how many people who have been 
made spiritually alive, live essentially somewhat as vampires, don't they? They love to still sleep in their coffin. They love to still live according to that pattern in which they once lived when they were spiritually dead. No, no, no. Uh, When we were spiritual dead, we felt comfortable in trespasses and sins, but now having come to new life, we feel that we have to escape that coffin and leave it behind. But it was once different when we, as it says here in the verse, as we walked as those who now works in the sons of disobedience. You see, when we were in sin, we responded to Satan's guidance, so to speak. But but now it's different. Now we're no longer dominated by the prince of the power of the air. Uh, No longer, as it says here in verse 3, that we conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh. No longer. This proved that we were sons of disobedience because we conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh. And we were, as it says there in verse 3, and were by nature children of wrath. Because we surrendered to the old man, because we surrendered to the world and to the devil, we were by nature children of wrath. We rightfully deserved the wrath of God, and we deserved it because of who we were by our heritage. We were children of wrath, children of rebellion. Now, some people don't like that phrasing. First of all, they don't like the idea that we have inherited this place as children of wrath, but we have. Some people don't like the idea that a child is born into the world a sinner, someone under the power of sin. But I can prove it to you quite naturally. If you've ever been a parent, you know very well. You don't have to teach your children to tell lies, do you? You have to teach them to tell the truth. You don't have to teach your children to be naughty. You have to teach them to be good. Sin is just within a child. It's born within a child. Every child is born has displayed itself either as a daughter of Eve or a son of Adam. Everyone was born with that stain of sin except for Jesus Christ himself. And because of this, we are born as children of wrath. Might I say that refers to the righteous wrath of God that people are under. You know, when you think about salvation, sometimes we think of being saved from our sins. And that's a valid way to think of salvation, isn't it? And sometimes we think of being saved from Satan and his power. And that's a valid way to think of salvation, isn't it? And sometimes we think of being saved from this wicked world and the worldliness around us. And that's another valid way to speak of salvation. But you know the most important thing you need to be saved from? You need to be saved from God. You need to be saved from his righteous wrath that you deserve as a rebellious sinner against him. And that's why we need this change of nature. Now, when I say that, I don't mean to say that God is against you because God has made the provision for you to be saved from this wrath of his. But unless you accept it, you are by nature, as it says there, a child of wrath. So the picture painted by these first three verses is very dark, is it not? The picture painted is of spiritual death, of spiritual rebellion, of people who are rightful targets of the wrath of God. But here in verse 4, the light begins to shine, right? He's painted the picture very darkly in the first three verses, but now comes the shining light into verse 4. It's wonderful just to look at it and read it. He says, but God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, he explains they're the motive of God in reconciliation. It's his great love. Of course, maybe we should just spend a couple minutes just thinking about those first two words, but God. Isn't that wonderful? The the horrible state that man was in, but God decided to do something. You know, here we are, children of wrath, destined for destruction, slaves of sin, dead in trespasses and sins, by nature children of wrath, sons of disobedience, but God decided to do something to save us. And why did he do it? Because of his great love. You see, with those two words, but and because, Paul explains God's reason behind reconciling man to himself. And these reasons are found totally in God. The reasons are this, his rich mercy and his great love. Look at it again in verse four. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. You see, he focuses his great love upon us and he grants his rich mercy to us. You see, he loved us with this great love. And that's probably the best part of the verse. But God, who is rich in mercy, and because of his great love, with which he loved us. 
Now, I can imagine a man who is very wealthy in money, right? Uh, but, I don't know, pick somebody you want, but Bill Gates, who is rich in money, and even if you were to say that he has great love, I mean, I don't know the man. Maybe he does, maybe he doesn't. But just for the sake of analogy, let's say, uh, but Bill Gates, who is rich in money, and because of his great love, well, it's wonderful if Bill Gates has a lot of money and a lot of love, but unless he focuses it on me, it doesn't make any difference. But what does it say there? God is rich in mercy. Okay, we agree in that. He's great in love with which he loved us. We might imagine a God of rich mercy and of great love who did not focus that mercy and love upon us. But the good news of God's salvation offered in Jesus is that this mercy and love is extended to us. You see, we are the objects of this great love. Now, I have to explain something here. When you read verse 4 and understand it, you say, he loves me. He loves me with this rich mercy, with this great love. It's a beautiful verse. But some people twist the idea of God's rich mercy and God's great love into something that justifies our pride. Some people imagine that God loves us because we are so lovable. Th that it says something great about me that God loves me. The attitude is something like this. I'm so wonderful that even God loves me. And some people try to promote that idea among people. You know what? That is not the idea at all. The idea is not that I am so wonderful that even God loves me. No, the idea is that God is so wonderful that he loves even me. That he loves the kind of person who's described in the first three verses. Somebody who's dead. Somebody who's sinful. Somebody who uh, walks among the sons of disobedience. Who conducts himself in the lusts of the flesh. God loves even that person. God's love is so great that it extends even to the unlovely. To the children of wrath that were mentioned in the previous verse. This shows us that every reason for God's love and mercy is found in him. We give him no reason to love us, yet in the greatness of his love, he loves us with that great love anyway. So before I go on to verse 5, I just have to apply a point here. This is something very practical for our Christian life, that we must stop trying to make ourselves lovable to God. This is a deep psychological impulse within many people. And it's, it's the ruin of many a Christian life. Many a Christian life feels defeated and joyless because they feel they must constantly supply God a reason to love them. While God all along is just saying, I give you my love because I am rich in mercy and great in love. That is one of the great secrets of the Christian life. Well, continuing on with this idea of God's great reconciliation here in verses 5 through 7, he says, even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. You know, this answers a question. When did God start loving you? Well, he started loving you when you decided to do better, right? When you started feeling guilty about what such a bad person you were and you made some resolutions to do better and you started turning over a new leaf and all the rest of it. No, no, no. When did he love you? He loved you when you were dead. Did you see that there in verse 5? It says it very plainly. Even when you were dead in trespasses, he made you alive together with Christ. God didn't wait until you were lovable. He loved you even when you were dead in trespasses, providing nothing lovable to him. And I guess you could say that's the first requirement for being saved. But what does a person have to be in order to be saved? Well, they have to be dead. Dead to every attempt to justify themselves before God. And then, having been dead, was it saying there in verse 5? He made us alive together in Christ. This is what God did to those who were dead to sin. Jesus shared in our death so that we could share in his resurrection life. 
The old man is crucified, and now we're new creations with, in Jesus, with old things having passed away and all things becoming new. And, and Paul can't say that without adding very emphatically right there, by grace you have been saved. Paul was compelled to add here that this was the work of God's grace, in no way involving the merit of man. Our salvation, our rescue from spiritual death was God's work done for the undeserving. But not only was it done out of the motive of grace, it extends so far that it says right there that he has made us to sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. It says it in verse 6. Now this is the present position of the Christian. We have a new place for living, a new arena for existence. We're not those any longer who dwell on the earth, but now our citizenship is in heaven. I want you to notice very carefully what it says there in verse 6. It says that we would sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. It doesn't say with. We don't yet sit in the heavenly places with Christ Jesus. Not yet. That's for when we're in glory with him. Instead, we sit in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Our life, our identity is in Christ. So if he sits in heavenly places, guess what? So do we. And now we sit in those heavenly places. That, and now this is absolutely amazing. Look at it here carefully in verse 7. In the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace. You see, in the future, in eternity future, so to speak, God will continue to show the exceeding riches of his grace, and he'll never stop dealing with us on the basis of grace. He'll forever continue to unfold its riches to us throughout eternity. It's so that he would show for his own purposes how glorious his work is in saving and redeeming us. And let me give you a very um, interesting suggestion here from verse 7. You could say from this, it's clear that Paul fully expected the gospel of grace to be preached in the ages to come. It's not just a temporary fix or a temporary bandage. No, uh, you could take it, again, as Charles Spurgeon says, he says, when all the saints shall be gathered home, they shall still talk and speak of the wonders of Jehovah's love in Christ Jesus. And in the golden streets, they shall all stand up and tell what the Lord has done for them to the listening crowds of angels and principalities and powers. I think an angel in, in, in heaven, so to speak, again, will be proclaiming to the angels the great riches of his grace. But think about that phrase again, verse seven, you, you shouldn't leave it lightly the riches of his grace. That's how great God is. His grace is rich. It's as much as you want. God has as much grace as the whole universe requires. You can't out -sin the grace of God. You can't take from his grace and make less of it. It's not like there's constant withdrawals on the account of God's grace. And he says, whoa, it's getting low. I have to add more to it. No, no, it's as if you thought you could empty the Pacific Ocean by taking cups of water out of it. It's impossible. You'll never diminish it. You want to know how great the grace of God is? I'll give you one way to see how great his grace is. One of the great aspects of the grace of God is to see how he begs man to receive it. Think of the situation. You offer somebody a gift, right? Out of just kindness. You, you say, well, I think I'll give this person a gift. They don't deserve it, but I'm feeling in a nice mood. Here, here's a gift, and the person refuses it. Matter of fact, not only do they refuse it, they say, and I never want to see you again. I, just get away from me. How many of us would begin to beg that person to receive the gift that we want to give them? No, quite the contrary. We would say, well, if you don't want my gift, then you'll never have it. I'll go find somebody who wants it. But what does God do with us? Listen, how many of us received Jesus Christ at the first time he ever made an appeal to our heart? Very few of us. Now, most of us pushed Jesus away and away, and we told him to come back, and we told him not today, and we said, I don't think so, and we pushed him away, but he kept persistent with us until he was begging us to receive his grace. Now, that is rich grace to keep coming back with an invitation after it's refused and refused and refused again. But that is how rich in grace he is. Now, to sum up this great idea of God's work of individual uh, uh, reconciliation, look now at verses 8 through 10. He says, For by grace you have been saved, through faith. 
and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You see, Paul cannot speak of this glorious work that God does without reminding us that it's a gift of grace and that it's given to the undeserving. Uh, Let me make this very clear to you. We are not saved by our faith. Sometimes we speak of that, don't we? I know we just speak sort of quickly and efficiently and we speak of somebody being saved by faith. I say it again, you're not saved by faith. You're saved by grace. That grace is received by faith. But make no mistake about it, you're not saved because you have so much faith. We are saved by grace and through faith. Let me picture it to you this way. Think of water flowing through a hose. Now, the water is the important part, right? But the water is communicated through the hose. Well, the hose is like your faith. The water is like the grace. But but you don't say, oh, what a wonderful hose. It quenched my thirst. No, it was the water that quenched your thirst. The hose just delivered it to you. Now, the the hose brings the water to a place where you can benefit by it. But please me, you can't drink the hose. You can only drink the water that comes to you through the hose. And the water is like the grace of God. That is what brings salvation to us. But but this salvation, as Paul says very plainly here in verse uh, 8, he says, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. This work of salvation is God's gift. Now, I have to make something clear to you, again, from the grammar that Paul uses here. When he says in verse 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. The that that he refers to in verse 8, very clearly in the ancient Greek grammar, it refers back to salvation. The that not of yourselves refers to the salvation that the believer receives. In this particular verse, he is not saying that the faith is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Very clearly, he's saying, and I would rely on this for the great Greek scholar Dean Alford, who clearly pointed out that the this not of yourselves refers to salvation, not to faith, in this particular passage. Now, I don't mind saying for a moment that even our faith is a gift of God. We cannot believe in Jesus unless God does a prior work in us. We're blinded by our own deadness. We're blinded by the God of this age. And so God must do a prior work in us. He he must breathe within us that faith by which we can believe. But in this particular passage, that that not of yourselves refers to salvation and not to faith. But very definitely, he says that this salvation is, again, not of works lest anyone should boast. If salvation were the accomplishment of man in any way, then we could boast about it. But under God's plan of salvation, only God receives the glory. Uh, Have you ever learned anything about Napoleon? I'm reading about his life right now. And it's very interesting. There was this great time when Napoleon, uh, you know, bringing some order to France after the confusion and the terrors of the French Revolution. Napoleon wanted to be crowned as emperor over the French people. And so he had the Pope come, and the Pope was supposed to crown Napoleon and put the crown upon Napoleon's head. But you know what Napoleon did? He took that crown, and he put it upon his own head. It was his way of saying, I crown myself the king of France. Well, let me say this. If, if you're into saving yourself by your own works, isn't that exactly what you're doing? You're taking that crown of salvation, and you're pushing God away. You say, give me that golden crown of salvation, and I will put it upon my own head. I'll be my own savior. If you get to heaven, partly by grace and partly by works, then you can say, well, you know, God's work did a little bit for me, but but all the more it was all my own work. I put that crown upon my own head. And let me tell you, there's none of that in the kingdom of God. We just have to sit there and let God put the crown of salvation upon our head. Anyway, going on here, verse 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And then look at now at verse 10. For we are his workmanship. I want you to notice this. God saves us not merely to save us or to rescue us from the wrath that we so rightly deserve, but also to make something beautiful of us. 
Isn't that beautiful? It isn't just to say, well, I'll rescue your sorry soul from hell. But God says, I'll rescue your sorry soul from hell and I'll make something beautiful of it. I will make you my workmanship. Now, the ancient Greek word translated workmanship here is a beautiful word. It's the ancient Greek word poema. It's the same word from which we get our English word poem. The idea is that God makes us his beautiful poem. I like the Jerusalem Bible in its translation of this. It says that God, or excuse me, it says that we are his work of art. That's what God's making us. You know what this tells us? It tells us that God's salvation and God's love is a transforming love. It meets us right where we are, but when we receive this love, it takes us to where we should be going. The love of God that saves my soul will also change my life and make it into something beautiful unto God. Every once in a while, you'll see people uh, marching in the streets, and I don't mean to pick on any particular group, but I just remember seeing this on the, the television on some previous occasion. Again, without particular uh, pointing at any particular group, I, I remember seeing a, a demonstration of homosexual activists. And they're marching through the streets and they're, they're trying to say that, you know, they're wonderful and they're approved. And, and, and some of them were carrying a sign that says, God loves me just the way I am. Well, now, is that a true statement or a false statement biblically? My friends, it is entirely a true statement. God does love them and loves any sinner. Again, I'm not trying to point out any particular sin in the sense, just the sense that God loves any sinner just the way that they are. Nevertheless, if they will receive God's love, and if they will receive it by faith, that God's love will begin to transform them into something beautiful in his eyes. I suppose it's expecting greater theological sophistication than you should expect from somebody carrying a placard or a sign at a demonstration. But if you really wanted to make it right, you, you, you'd make the sign that says, God loves me just the way I am, and he's making me into something beautiful unto him. His workmanship, his changing of my life. We are his workmanship, his creation, something new that he makes of us in Jesus Christ. And that's why you can say, look at the end of verse 10. We are his workmanship, his work of heart, art, his poema, created in Christ Jesus for good works. That's the beautiful thing that God is making of us. It's active in good works. These are just as much a part of God's predestined plan as anything else. I think sometimes people get the wrong view of God's predestination. They think of God's predestination as only relevant to salvation. Well, I'm predestined to be saved. Hallelujah. It also means that you're predestined to good works. You're predestined to holy living. So take predestination all in all, predestined to salvation, to good works, to holy living. Now, he's talked about in these first 10 verses, salvation in the sense of an individual work between God and the believer. But now starting at verse 11, it seems as if Paul changes his focus, not so much about the reconciliation of the believer unto God, which he has pointed out beautifully there in the first 10 verses. Now, from verse 11 to 22, he begins to speak about the reconciliation of Jew and Gentile together. Now again, I want to remind you something. Remember what we talked about back in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10? where he talked about making sense of this great problem of the universe and reconciling and summing up and gathering together all things in Jesus Christ, making Jesus the great answer of the equation of the universe? Well, if God can do that ultimately with all the loose ends in the universe, he wants to show it first he can do it with the individual life, and then he can do it with Jew and Gentile. Look at here, verse 11. He says, therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. You see, what Paul's reminding us of is that God's work of reconciliation is not only between God and the individual, though it must begin there, 
It is also between groups of people who are at odds. And in Paul's day, the greatest division in humanity, at least as far as his circle was concerned, was between Jew and Gentile. You see, the Gentiles were in a desperate place. They were aliens, strangers, having no hope, and they were without God, as Paul points out here. And this shows that not only were they spiritually dead, they didn't even have the access to God that the Jews enjoyed. And so no hope. Without God in the world, as he says here, they were without Christ. That at that time, you were without Christ, as he says there in verse 12. Well, without Christ, those are terrible words. Can you imagine all the implications of those words? It sort of sums up the woeful condition of the lost man or the lost woman. What does it mean to be without Christ? Well, it means you're without spiritual blessings. It means you're without light. You're without peace. You're without rest. You're without safety. You're without hope. You're without a prophet, a priest, or a king. Without Christ. A terrible, terrible description of anybody. And they were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. This is the Gentile world separated from God. But now look at the solution here in verse 13. Here's another one of the great buts of Ephesians chapter 2. The first one was but God in verse 2. Now we have in verse 13, but now, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once were afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. You see, the Gentiles who were now in Christ Jesus, they're no longer far off. They used to be separated from God and his blessings and his covenants and his promises. But now they're made near to the things of God. And what has brought them near? The blood of Christ. That is his sacrificial death. Now, it's important that Paul connects the ideas of the love of Christ and his sacrificial death. Some people think that preaching Christ crucified is all about preaching a bloody, gory Jesus. But listen, the point about preaching Christ crucified, the point isn't really gore. The point is love. Preaching Christ crucified means that we preach a Savior full of love, sacrificial, giving, saving love, brought near by the blood of Christ. And please understand that that's the way you can come near to God. Some people think that you can come near by keeping the law or by belonging to a group. But the only way to be brought near to God is by the blood of Christ. What Jesus did on the cross, suffering as a guilty sinner in the place of guilty sinners, that is what brings us near to God. Now, continuing on, verse 14. He speaks about this healing of the division between Jew and Gentile. He says, For he himself is our peace, who has made the both one, and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the law of the commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. I tell you, this this is glorious. What did God do to bring peace between Jew and Gentile? Look at it there in verse 14. For he himself is our peace. It isn't that Jesus is the peacemaker. It's not like he came to the Jews and he came to the Gentiles and he said, look, let me make peace between you guys. No, he said, I will be your peace. Jew, believe in me. Gentile, believe in me. As you put your trust in me, I will make one new man out of the two. I will be your peace. And as he says it right there, it's absolutely staggering here. In verse 15, or excuse me, in verse 14, he says, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. You see, the work of Jesus on the cross is the common ground of salvation for both Jew and Gentile. Therefore, there's no longer any dividing wall between Jew and Gentile. Jesus broke down that wall. I think of Jesus hanging on the cross. Jesus looking down at the people there gathered around the foot of the cross. And there he sees some of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and they're mocking him. And they're so happy. They're so pleased 
that they have put Jesus up on that cross. And then Jesus looks up kind of from the other side, hanging there from the cross, and, and through his, his agony, he, he glances over and he sees the Romans. He sees the Gentiles, the epitome uh, of Gentile power there. Just uh, they're showing their strength and their authority and nobody messes around with Rome. And you, you pretended to be the king of the Jews. Well, this is what we do to pretended kings. We put them up on crosses. And Jesus looks and he sees Jewish sinners who need a savior. And he sees Gentile sinners who need a savior. And he says, by my work on the cross, I will bring them both into one body. I will make both one and I will break down the middle wall of separation. I want you to think about this. When Paul wrote this, he was under house arrest in Rome, awaiting trial because he was falsely accused by the Jews of taking a Gentile into the temple past a wall of separation that was supposed to divide Jew and Gentile. And Paul was falsely accused of bringing a Gentile past the wall of separation. I think as Paul says this to the man who's writing out the letter, and as he says these words, he probably smiles to himself because that wall of separation has been completely torn down by Jesus Christ. That wall of separation is gone because the common lordship of Jesus is greater than any previous division. If the lordship of Jesus is not greater to you than any difference that you have with other people, and when you think about the body of Christ, there's political differences. There's racial differences. There's economic differences. There's language differences. There's geographical differences. There's differences in the body of Christ. But the lordship of Jesus Christ is greater than any of those differences. And so we can come together as one body, no matter what any of those lesser differences are. And he abolished the enmity, he says there in verse uh, 14, having, excuse me, verse 15, having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in the ordinances. You see, the source of contention between Jew and Gentile was the fact that the Gentiles didn't keep the law. But since Jesus fulfilled the law on our behalf, and since he bore our penalty for failing to keep the law, we're reconciled through his work of redemption. It put to death the source of contention. So now uh, the, the Jew used to argue with the Gentile. The Jew used to shout at the Gentile, well, you're a lawless man. You don't keep the law of God. And then the Gentile used to yell back at the Jew, well, your laws are crazy. They're unfulfillable. They're, they're ancient relics and superstitions. And now both Jew and Gentile can say, the law is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. This thing that used to divide us, now it's fulfilled in Jesus. We don't have to worry about it dividing us any longer. That's why he can say in verse 16 that he might reconcile them both to God. Oh, this is great. In one body through Jesus Christ or through the cross. Jews and Gentiles are brought together into one body, which by the way, we call the church. That's where our unity in Jesus is far greater than our previous differences. Understand the weight of those words so as to create in himself one new man from the two. You see, this was God's solution. The, the Jewish people, and I don't blame them for thinking this, they thought they had it all figured out. They said, yes, salvation will come to the Gentiles. God will make the Gentiles Jews. They will come into the family of Judaism. Uh, that is how the Messiah will bring peace between Jew and Gentile. He'll make them proselytes. He'll make them Jews. And God says, no, 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 no. That isn't the plan at all. No, I'm not going to make Gentiles Jews. I'm going to take both Jew and Gentile, and I'm going to bring them together into one brand new body that I call the church. Did you know that early Christians recognize this very easily? Early Christians ask themselves, or excuse me, describe themselves. People would say, are you Jew or Gentile? They'd say, well, we're not Jews and we're not Gentiles. We are a third race. We're a new race. We're not Jews. We're not Gentiles. But we're one new man that embraces everybody who's in Christ Jesus. 
This is God's glorious plan for healing this divide between Jew and Gentile to make one new man in the church. And how does he do it? Again, you just have to admire Paul. He keeps coming back to it with the same energy that a blacksmith keeps beating the hammer upon the anvil. He just beats on it and beats on it and beats on it again. Look at it there in verse 16. That he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross. Again, it's all over the place. By his blood, through the cross, through his work on the cross for us. We, we see the emphasis Paul places on the work of Jesus on the cross, repeating it several times. We're made near by the blood, having abolished in his flesh the enmity. In one body, through the cross. Let me put it to you this way. This unity didn't just happen. This unity between Jew and Gentile was the hard-fought accomplishment of Jesus Christ on the cross. You know, when Jesus Christ prayed in John chapter 17, when he prayed for this great spiritual and mystical union of his people, it wasn't just a prayer. He prayed that knowing that he would have to go to the cross and win that unity. He knew that his agony would be used to answer that prayer for unity. And because God brings Jew and Gentile together into one body, reconciling the difference, now can you see that this is a preview of his great work described back in chapter 1, verse 10. You see, it's a partial fulfillment of God's eternal purpose, as stated in Ephesians 1, 10, that he might gather together in one all things in Christ. God's using uh, the, the bringing together of Jew and Gentile into the church as a preview of his ultimate work of summing up all things into Jesus Christ. If he can bring Jew and Gentile together, then he can make sense out of every mess in the universe. And that's exactly what he's going to do. Now look at how he describes Jew and Gentile coming together here in verses 17 and 18. He says, And he came near and preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. You see, as Jew and Gentile both respond to the same gospel, the same peace is preached to those afar off and to those near. In other words, it's not one gospel for the Jew and another gospel for the Gentile. No, if you're near to God, if you're far from it, listen, you still have to get saved the same way. You still have to come by faith through his great work on the cross. It's through him that we both have access by one spirit to the Father. You see, it's not just that Jew and Gentile are both saved by the same gospel, but they have the same access to God the Father. Isn't that a tendency? Perhaps a tendency. And you could understand this very logically, that, that a Jewish believer in the first century would feel like, well, I have a little better access to God than my pagan neighbor who comes to Christ. I've been raised with the truths of the Old Testament and the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob from I was the time I was a little boy. I've been circumcised in fulfillment of the law of Moses. I've, I've lived all my life honoring God with the rituals. Don't I have a little bit better access to, my God, to God than my neighbor who's been worshiping Zeus his whole life? And Paul says, no, you don't. We have the same access to God. One group does not have any greater access than any other. You know, when conflict arises among Christian groups today of different backgrounds, you can be sure that they're forgetting that they're saved by the same gospel and that they both have the same access to God. Usually one of the groups feels that in some way they're superior to the other group. You know, I have a little bit better access to God than those people, right? I'm not saying God has shut them out. They're just not quite as close to God as our group is. Do you see what rotten thinking that is? No, we both have the same access to God, saved by the same gospel, the same access to his throne. And so what does God do with it all? Well, that brings us to the last four verses of this chapter. You see, through this great work of Jesus on the cross, first in your individual reconciliation, right? That's what the first 10 verses were all about. You as an individual have to be reconciled to God. That's very important, right? Because this isn't just about 
you know, great movements of Jews and Gentiles and great races and great people groups on this earth. It's not about that. It's about the individual. The individual who was dead in trespasses and sins. God has wanted to redeem that individual. But the work of God does not end with the individual. It also extends into groups, into something great that God is building. Because God has a way of taking those individuals in the context of their groups and arranging them perfectly in his plan. That's what it's all about in these last four verses of the chapter. Look here, starting at verse 19. He says, now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Can you imagine how that sounded like music to the ears of the Gentile believers? Oh, all their life they had been made to feel excluded from the synagogue, excluded because of what they ate, excluded because of where they lived, excluded because of the people that they hung around. And now Paul looks at them and he puts his arms on their shoulders and he looks them straight in the eye and he goes, you're no longer a stranger and a foreigner. No, 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 you're a fellow citizen with the saints. You're a member of the household of God. You should not regard yourself as a second-class citizen in the kingdom of God in any regard. You know, today... The division in the church really isn't between Jew and Gentile. I suppose that in some parts of the world that may still be an issue. But aren't there still people within the body of Christ who feel as if they're second-class citizens? As if really they don't have the same access to God as other people do. Listen, if salvation is by grace through faith, if it really is the work of Jesus that is important for us, if it's his work on the cross that is our redemption and our access to God the Father, then might I say, you have the same access to God that the greatest men and women of faith who have ever walked this earth have. You're not a second-class citizen in the kingdom of God. The Apostle Paul would look you in the eyes this evening and say, you, he could write your name in after that, you, are no longer a stranger and a foreigner. You are a fellow citizen with the saints and a member of the household of God. Isn't this a message that needs to be preached today? Today, when people are so much looking for a sense of belonging, they're aching for this sense of belonging that God intended to supply through his body, through his church, through this work of Jesus on the cross. But instead, he says very plainly here again, verse 19, Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being joined together grows into a holy temple to the Lord, in which you also are being built together for a habitation of God in the Spirit. Now, he brings this thought, you know, fellow citizens, uh, no longer strangers and foreigners. Now you're members of the household of God. And they says, you know what God's doing? He's building a great temple. He's building a great building. And you are part of that great building that God is building. Now, what does he say about this building? Well, first of all, if you notice there in verse 20, it's built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. You see, because we're one body, And because we have the same access to God, it also follows that we are built together on the same foundation. And this foundation is the original apostles and prophets and their enduring revelation, which is recorded for us right here in the New Testament. No one may ever lay any other foundation. You see, the sense of trying to lay any other foundation is abhorrent to God. This shows us there was something unique about the work of the first century apostles and prophets who gave to us the New Testament. They laid the foundation, but then notice also what it says there in verse 20, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Literally what that means is that he is the foundation stone. He's the tip of the angle. It's the thing that ties the whole structure together, that that points out the lines for the entire structure. You start with a cornerstone that's perfectly square. And then you lay out every other stone in relationship to the cornerstone, and the whole building lays out perfectly. You see, the other stones are bound together according to their relationship to the cornerstone. That's what's important. And then God builds a building, doesn't he? Look at it there, verse 21. In whom the whole building, being joined together, 
grows into a holy temple in the Lord. As we keep to this common foundation, the whole building of God's people grows together in a beautiful way. It's a holy temple where God dwells in beauty and in glory. This tells us something beautiful. It tells us something about the church. It tells us that the church is a building, you know, perfectly designed by the great architect. Isn't that wonderful? You know, architects, well, I, I suppose there's probably never been a plan of architects made that, that's never had to have some kind of correction to it, right? The, the building gets done, and as it goes, oh, well, there's a correction that needs to be made here or there. You know, the plan of this architect has never needed to be corrected. He's the great architect, perfectly arranging the building. God's structure isn't a pile of haphazard stones. It's a beautiful arrangement of every stone in its place. So it's a building. But secondly, it's a dwelling place. It says right there, it grows together as a holy temple being joined together. Grows into a holy temple in the Lord and which you are being built together as a habitation for God in the spirit. The church isn't just a building, it's a dwelling place, a place where God lives. It's never intended to be an empty house that's virtually a museum with no one living inside. The church is to be both the living place of God and his people. And finally, not only is it a building, not only is it a dwelling place, but it is a temple, our text tells us. It's holy and set apart to God, and there we serve as priests, offering spiritual sacrifices of our lips and our hearts unto the Lord. You know, I think about this. I think about how God builds his temple, right? And I think about how Solomon built his temple. When Solomon's temple was built, the stones were prepared at a place far away from the building site. They said that you could not hear the sound of a hammer or an axe or iron tools at the building site of the temple when Solomon built the temple. In the same way, God chips away and fashions us and fits us perfectly, and then he puts us right into the place that we should be. This is how it works. God is preparing a house. The the, the father makes his choice of the house, and he designs the plans, and then the son purchases it with his own blood, and then the Holy Spirit says, I'm going to dwell in that house. I'm going to live in it. This is the holy house that God is building, mixing together these stones of Jew and Gentile and slave and free and male and female and people from every tribe and tongue all over the earth. It's a beautiful temple that the everlasting Father is building unto his own glory. You know, the great commentator Adam Clark, who's become a favorite of mine over the last few years, he explained how God's work in the church gave his glory, excuse me, gave glory to his wisdom and power and his love. You see, when we see all this, we see the greatness of God's work in the church. That there's nothing as noble as the church. I mean, it is the temple of God. What greater nobility is that in a building? There's nothing so worthy as reverence. If God dwells in the church, then that is a revered place. There's nothing so ancient as the church. The patriarchs and the prophets worked to build it. There's nothing as solid as the church. Jesus Christ is the foundation of it. There's nothing as high as the church because as it reaches as high as the heavenly places in Jesus Christ, there's nothing so perfect and well-proportioned since the Holy Spirit himself is the builder of it and God the Father is the architect. There's nothing more beautiful because the temple of God, the church of God, is adorned with building stones of every age, every place, every people, from the highest kings to the lowest peasants to the most brilliant scientists and philosophers to the simplest believers. And there's nothing more spacious because it's spread across the whole earth and it takes in everyone who has been washed by the blood of the Lamb. There's nothing so divine as this structure that God's building in the church because it's a living building. It's animated and inhabited by the Holy Spirit. Now you take a look at this. Say, oh Lord, how great are your works. How marvelous is your ability to build, to reconcile, to sum up. If you would have looked at the division between Jew and Gentile in the first century, you would have said, no way. They can never come together. They can never be at peace with themselves. There's always going to be enmity between the two. And then God came along with the work of Jesus on the cross and his mysterious work of building the church. And he said, no, I've reconciled them right here in the church. Take a look. 
And then you say, Lord, if you can do that, you can reconcile the universe. And God said, that's exactly what I'm going to do. The answer of all things will be summed up in my son, Jesus Christ, according to Ephesians 1.10. I've given you a peer review of it. In the individual work of reconciliation that I've done in your life, you were dead in trespasses and sins, but he made you alive. And in this great work of bringing Jew and Gentile together. Well, Paul's not finished speaking to us about this great mystery of the church and what God is working out through the church in the eternal plan of the ages that he has. But we'll have to save more for that for next week when we get to Ephesians chapter 3. So let's pray. Lord, we think about this and, um, well, Father, I suppose we have to repent before you, Lord, because sometimes it is possible for us to have a very low opinion of your church, to think lightly of it, to, to think of it in much lower terms than you do. And Lord, we just want to repent of that this evening. We see how high, how great, how glorious, how wonderful, how beautiful is this church that you have made, Lord. And I'm not speaking of any particular congregation or any particular building, Lord. We're thinking of your great church as it exists as a spiritual body, combining Jew and Gentile and slave and free and Greek and barbarian and male and female. Lord, it's a glorious thing across all the ages. Lord, we don't want to think lightly of it. So we love you, Lord. We thank you for your work of individual reconciliation and redemption, making those of us who were dead now alive in Christ Jesus. But Lord, we also thank you for this great work of your plan of the ages, reconciling Jew and Gentile as a preview of your ultimate reconciliation of all things according to your great wisdom and love and righteousness in Jesus Christ. All we can do is say we thank you and we praise you for it all. In Jesus' name, amen.